Let's turn our attention to, well, what we are doing about coronavirus in terms of uh, the vaccine, in terms of testing and tracing and uh, how long this is all going to last. Let's talk to Dr. David Nabarro. He's Special Envoy on COVID-19 to the World Health Organization. He's also a Professor of Global Health at Imperial College London. Good morning to you. Good morning, Julia. Good morning to all your listeners. Yes, lovely to speak to you once again. Um, in, in terms of some of the criticisms that we heard from Sir Keir Starmer, the uh, uh, Labour leader yesterday at Prime Minister's Questions, about the, the government having been slow into lockdown, slow on testing, slow on protective equipment, and now slow to take up offers from British firms. I know you don't want to get involved in, in, in party politics at all, but uh, do you think any of those criticisms have validity? Are any of them right? So... What I'm really interested in now is how we're going to move forward. And just listening to all the comments on your news just now and also even to the advertisement that we heard, uh, the the comment was these are going to be extraordinary times and we're going to have to shift the way in which we behave, but we're going to have to do it in a very thought-through way. And I suppose the thing that I would really say about how I'm seeing things in the UK is that there is a lot of very careful thinking going on with the public health people talking to different uh, actors in government and they're saying, well, we are going to be able to find a new way of living and a new way of working and that is going to be the future and let's focus on that. You know, I'm not going to actually look back and say things could have been done differently with hindsight. That's not helpful. What matters now is moving forward. And as I keep saying to people, there'll be so many opportunities for a forensic analysis of what's happened in the past. Let's do those when we've got through the current crisis and they're able to at least have the luxury of being able to look back. Indeed, I think there'll be a lot of people listening to that and nodding along. Yeah, absolutely. We should have scrutiny, of course. But again, we are where we are. And we did start uh, yes. from, a, uh, you know, from, a, I, mean, I, I mean, I think there's not really a single government in the world that isn't getting some criticism for how they've dealt with this. And of course, we know that the governments that have done very well, um, even like Germany, they're still getting criticism at home. And even in South Korea, of course, yep. a lot of those Southeast Asian countries, they started in a way, uh, way ahead of us simply because they had had the experience of uh, other coronavirus epidemics previously, which luckily we didn't suffer from yeah and I, and you're absolutely right that countries of east asia had a kind of dress rehearsal with a coronavirus that caused something called severe acute respiratory syndrome or sars and they got the message that because this this kind of virus is so dangerous and just can get into societies and cause such a lot of suffering that you have to be on the defence right from the start and you have to continue to be on the defence because the virus hasn't gone away. That's why this new announcement from uh, the UK that I'm hearing of actually training a lot of people to assist with identifying people who've got the disease and helping them to isolate and tracing their contacts and helping them to isolate, that's going to be the key to the new life that we're talking about because we're going to have to be on the defence against this disease for the foreseeable future until some kind of vaccine is available that everybody can access. But I just heard your clip from Chris Whitty, which is an important one, that it's going to be some time before the vaccine is available with sufficient volume and tested for safety. So we're going to have to be able to learn to live with this virus for the foreseeable future in ways that don't lead to large sections of the population, for example, older people being isolated in a way that is just totally unhelpful to them and unhelpful to society. It's a kind of experiment in which we're all involved and we're going to have to all work it through together and find the right ways forward because we've never had it before. And I I kind of am very positive about what I'm seeing in the UK and in other countries, a sense of people everywhere saying we're all in this together and we've got to come through it together. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And yet there is a strong argument for getting sort of where we can younger people back to work. When I say younger people, I'm, I'm going to include myself at that, in that at the age of 51, I, rather I than everyone, <laughs> rather than having everyone on lockdown uh, who, who isn't perhaps vulnerable yes. or elderly. And and we're going to be talking about this a little bit later in this hour. But, you know, there, there is going to effectively be a, a two tier society, those people who still have to stay on lockdown, even when we have all the testing and contact tracing until we have that vaccine. That's just the reality, isn't it? I think there are realities, but also at the same time, we've got to really focus on what are the key elements of society that matter to us. And avoiding the isolation of a lot of older people seems to be really, really important. I've been contacted by people in my age group around 70 saying to me, are we ever going to see our younger relatives again or are we going to be prevented from seeing them? And over time, we'll establish the right way of doing this. At the moment, it seems a bit frightening 
But what will happen is we'll work out the right protocols for protecting ourselves, protecting other people and making certain that we can still go on with life. A little bit like behavior had to change when we discovered that the virus causing AIDS, the HIV, was carried through sex. It didn't mean that sex stopped. It just meant we found ways of being intimate without uh, actually having to put ourselves at danger. And I think that this will be exactly the same for the COVID. The beginning will be tough and there'll be a lot of anxieties. But because we are ingenious as humans, we will find ways of doing this and they will be shared very, very quickly. So, for example, we'll work out how we're going to deal with the need to protect ourselves. We'll work out the right role for face coverings. We'll be guided by the evidence and the evidence will evolve. But all together, we will find ways through this. And, and actually, I think just if you don't mind me saying so, Julia, because the COVID is exposing some of the fragilities in our societies anyway, for example, as we heard just now on the relationship between social care and hospital care, we will find that we have to work these things out fast because we can't go on with the problems that have existed for so long because they will create greater uh, vulnerability to the COVID. So mending things that have actually not been working yeah. right for some yeah. time will become we a may priority. come out of this. Yeah, we may come out of this stronger, uh, as you say. And I have to say, I, I do think there has been some incredible community spirit as well. And I think yeah. the bonding, and I think a lot of families, a lot of families really struggling right now. A lot of people, particularly whether they're very young or elderly, isolated on their own, really struggling. But people going out of their way to help people, complete strangers, uh, and and families having a chance to come together and spend time together. Okay, maybe a bit more quality time than perhaps a lot of parents would have wanted. Yes, but um, sure. we, we we may well come out of this uh, forward. And it's nice to hear your positivity as an expert in this field. How positive are you? How optimistic are you about not just how we can test and contact trace and how we can learn to live with this virus, but in terms of vac the vaccination? These human trials start today in Oxford. Uh, there's so much hope. But you say Chris Whitty is trying to, you know, he, he's not putting a damper on it. He wants us to be realistic about this. But um, how hopeful are you that we will actually say by the end of the year, see some sort of rolling out of a vaccine? I'm hopeful that a vaccine will be developed. I don't think it's beyond the capacity of science to find a way to do it. And the incredible collective effort by scientists all over the world to really come, on, come out with a viable vaccine is really good. All I'm just saying is it takes time. I've, I've watched how other vaccines have been developed against other diseases. And there are lots of steps between having a candidate vaccine, even uh, using it with human volunteers, as we're hearing is starting to happen now, and then all the way through to having the vaccine available, tested, found to be safe, found to actually work, and then produced in sufficient quantity that it can get to the people who need it. So all I'm saying is, yes, I'm pretty certain it will come but I really do not like putting a date on it saying it will be by the end of the year or it will be by the middle of next year. Uh, it, we will get it. But in the meantime, every one of us is going to have to be thinking hard about how we behave, how we work, how we behave at work, how we behave socially so that we are not exposing ourselves or more importantly, others to dangers as a result of this virus. Just one particular thing that I want everybody to remember. The, the, the area where it's been totally awful is in residential care, where we've seen the virus come into places where older people have been cared for uh, residentially and, and leading to a lot of suffering and death. And it's so finding ways to continue to care for older people, particularly in residential settings, without staff having to go and be virtually in isolation themselves, is going to be one of the very in important challenges we as a society have to deal with. Because even if I get the COVID and I'm only mildly affected, I have a huge responsibility not to go and take that virus to other people who might then go, go on and get really, really ill. It's that sense of not just being responsible by myself, but being responsible for others through the way I behave. That's what's going to emerge. And that's going to be the hallmark of societies that are able to be strong in the face of this virus for the weeks and months to come until we've got a vaccine. Dr. David Nabarro, thank you so much for joining us, Special Envoy in COVID-19 to the World Health Organization. He was also uh, involved in running the UN's response to the Ebola uh, outbreak. And he's now Professor of Global Health at Imperial College. We can, we can trust what he's saying. I've got a lot of, a lot of hope, actually, about that, about ingenious humans and how we are going to find a way through this.